If I have it there, will that help? Are you done, Lynn? I'm done. Okay. That's it. That's it. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to this weekend. Uh, thank you for being on the same path that I've been on for about 20 years now. You can't hear me? There you go. Okay, I'll, I'll pick this up. How's that? Is that better? If it doesn't, can't jiggle, however. Hi, Pam. Hi. Hi, Pete. <laughs> Any other details we need to know? There's someone in there. I still can't be. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, what I would like to do is make this uh, truly interactive because um, we can, I can talk about the course as anybody can here for hours and hours and hours on end. I love it. It's the most amazing piece of writing ever come across. It's the most incredible information, the most brilliant uh, language. Every part, every aspect of the course I totally love. But you've done that. You're doing that yourself. You don't need me to talk to you about the course. You know the course. You know your course. And that's the only course you need to know. So what you'll find, um, <clears throat> particularly on a weekend like this, where there's maybe 20 different uh, presenters, you'll probably find 20 different ways of reading and being with the course. And don't let that confuse you. I would uh, strongly urge you to use the course in a way that works for you, because that's the only way to do the course. So it's not the way I do it necessarily, it's not the way Pam does it, it's not the way Lynn does it, it's not the way Monica does it, it's not the way Tom in the back does it, but it's the way you do it. I'll give you a little background um, <clears throat> about how I came to the course and what my uh, wonderful story was. I was having lunch with somebody, um, a, a wonderful lawyer from Florida, who really didn't like the fact that Course in Miracles students kept telling their story. And I said, well, you should come to Costa Rica, because in Costa Rica you're not allowed to tell your story. <laughs> I'm not interested in your story. Um, <clears throat> the Blackfoot Indians in Alberta have a wonderful tradition. They have a healing circle, just like we do. And in that circle, you're allowed to tell your story twice, and the third time, we turn the chairs around. You know, it's, I'm not interested. Now, why is that? Because who I think I am is the story. And so what I want to do is tell you the story over and over and over so that you will actually believe that who I think I am is who I am. And by doing that, I'll never get out of it. Does that make sense? Yes. You want to be in Paris or Budapest? Uh, sure, this sure, is sure. Oh, you want Zurich? Yeah. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, um, since you are new and you haven't heard my story, I'll tell my story very quickly. <laughs> I've already heard it twice. I've heard it. <laughs> Turn your chair around. <laughs> Actually, I'll go in the back of the room. How's that? So you don't have to turn your chair around. Um, my story starts in Indonesia on Java 1942, where the Japanese invaded. And my parents fled into the mountains, and two months later, after I was born, in July, in September, we were all in, um, in concentration camps where I spent three and a half years. So in the camp, I saw all kinds of incredible things. I saw women being tortured. It was a women's camp, because the women and men were separated. And I saw women being tortured. I saw women dying. Um, it certainly imprinted my mind to a very high degree with regards to my relationship to women. That's for sure. After that, I spent the next five years in Indonesia uh, in a war-torn country, fighting every day with uh, local Indonesian kids because I was white, I was Dutch. And then I was shipped off to Holland when I was eight, where I fought every day with white kids because they said I was black, uh, because I was so dark from having lived in the tropics. And so I got discrimination from all kinds. And then the third time I got discrimination was uh, when I was playing a game, an international game against an English team, and <clears throat> somebody flattened me from behind and said, you're fucking Jew. So then I got it three ways. So I got it because I was black, I was, got it because I was white, and I got it because I was Jewish. The bottom line of that is it doesn't matter what you get. It doesn't matter what people say to you. It makes absolutely no difference. What matters is what am I going to do with that? 
And what I'm going to do with that, that's where the um, theme for this weekend is so incredibly important. So the ancient hatred that I made up in, during the war years, and I came to this in a holotropic breathing. How many of you have done holotropic breathing? Sort of show? Wow, what a group, fantastic. In that breathing, what suddenly became clear to me is that I was responsible for all the suffering I'd seen in the camps. I was responsible for all the camps in the world. I was responsible for the Second World War. So if you imagine as a tiny little creature from the table about this high, taking on that level of guilt, it's going to be expressed somehow. And with me it got expressed in incredible anger, rage, uh, later on uh, profound and dedicated drug and alcohol use, abuse, some it would say, a bottle of vodka a day was the average. Um, all kinds of drugs, all kinds of other amazing destructive behavior in order to prove that who I thought I was was who I was. And that went on for 50 years. And then I got to the point where I said, if I cannot make a difference, if I cannot change what I'm doing now, then my life is over, because I had absolutely no desire to continue. And that's when the course uh, fell sort of in my lap. It didn't really fall in my lap, somebody gave it to me, and I opened it two years earlier, and I opened it and I saw um, sin is lack of love as darkness is lack of light. And I thought, wow, that is brilliant, because that's what I've always known to be true. And suddenly there it was, and it was true for me at that moment. And the next line was about the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son. I said, fuck this, this is not for me. And I threw it away. Two years later, when I got to the point of uh, absolute desperation and complete dark, dark depression, uh, I opened the course again. And this time I did not see any of the offensive Christian language. <coughs> I didn't see it. I saw the word God, I saw the word Father, I saw the word Son, and all I kept seeing was love. And that's all I saw. And then I said, okay, I'm going to give this book a year. And for the first time in my life, I'm going to do what somebody or something tells me to do, which I'd never done before. I've, I was, uh, even though I played sports at an international level, I was generally considered in uncoachable. I did what I wanted to do. Um, I was kicked off teams and allowed back on because I happened to have enough talent to be on the team, but not because they wanted me on the team as a person, but because I had something physical to offer. But I played sports because I hated myself, and by playing really well, I could humiliate you. And that's why I played. And so the more, the better I got, the more I could humiliate you, and that was my purpose for a long, long time. Uh, the same with debating. I would go <clears throat> to parties and I would stand in one corner and debate one point of view and win the debate, and I would go to another corner and argue the opposite, opposing point of view and win that debate. My whole purpose was to destroy the opposition, and the opposition was anybody. Anybody. And now, looking back at that, it's of course obvious to me that what I was seeing was just myself over and over and over, and what I wanted to do, destroy was the self. What I learned by doing that is that the self, capital S self, cannot be destroyed, and it just waits lovingly and patiently and with a big smile. And the small S self, that there's a fantastic line in the course, um, it has to, it, it's a little section on your worth is established by God. And as long as this is in debate, any, any activity including, especially one that involves superiority and inferiority, uh, will present you with difficulty. And then it says, the ego is never at stake because God did not make it. And the spirit is never at stake because he did. And so what I was involved in was trying to destroy the ego. Not understanding that it was the ego trying to destroy the ego. So it's always an inside game. And so what I had to learn to do um, through all those years of substance abuse and abuse of really of any kind, abuse of other people, abuse of myself, it, it didn't matter that that was my life for 50 years. But what I had to learn to do is to recognize that what I had done, um, and it's a long list of stuff I've done, had absolutely no impact on who I was. And when I first let that in, I started to cry. And I cried and cried and cried because that, the truth of that was so breathtaking. 
that who I am has never been affected by anything I've done, anything I've thought, anything I've said, anything I didn't say or didn't do, who I am is unchangeably innocent. <coughs> and that to me is such an unbelievable message, and that's the message of A Course in Miracles. And to me, that is so hugely powerful. And we now have, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the history of the, of the center that we have in Costa Rica. And Claudia, my partner, and I worked there with uh, 12 other people. In 1964, when um, <coughs> I first immigrated from Holland to Canada, um, I went to see a psychiatrist because I knew I was depressed. And I knew I was depressed because I'd been depressed all my life, but I felt totally black. In Holland, before I immigrated, I had several psychotic episodes. Uh, if I had done that now, I would have been labeled bipolar, borderline personality, autism, schizophrenia, chronic depression, uh, you name it. Every label in the DSM-5 would have been thrown at me uh, with good reason. But fortunately, I didn't grow up in the time of the DSM-5. So nobody paid any attention to me. The only attention I got was getting kicked out of school after school after school, and that was fine. That, that I could live with. Anyway, in 64, I went to see a psychiatrist. And uh, he gave me, he put me on Ritalin, which uh, I absolutely loved because I felt like a genius on it. It was unbelievable. Um, I didn't realize how much damage it was going to do. I was on that stuff for seven years. And I still have electric flashes in my brain from Ritalin withdrawal, and that's now 40 or 45 years ago. But what I also realized, having seen a psychiatrist in those days, you could not tell anyone you'd gone to see a psychiatrist. Because that meant you were insane. Now, I had no trouble admitting that I was insane because I know I was. But I also know that I had to talk to somebody about that, and I thought... Um, <laughs> I received a magazine in those days, it was called Maison de Marie Claire from France, and in the back of it were real estate, was a real estate pages. And in those days you could still buy a whole village in the south of France for about $50,000. So they would have uh, 12 houses, a small church, uh, all kinds of other wonderful things. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be something to get together with other people and buy a village and renovate it and turn it into a therapeutic village? where people could say we're going to France for a holiday, in effect they were going to France because their life was screwed up. <laughs> it never happened. It never happened, but uh, the dream never left me. And so I did develop several plans over the years about this dream and how to make it happen, blah, 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 but it never did, till about 11 years ago. One of, my, one of my clients said, I'm selling a house and I've got 50000 that I would like to invest if you still want to do your center in Costa Rica. And I said, great. Uh, almost impulsively, I said, great, knowing full well that 50000 wasn't going to do it and I didn't have to worry about actually opening a center. <laughs> but within a week, there were five other people that completely unasked by me came forth and said, we would like to invest in a center in Costa Rica if you want to do it. So by that time, my bluff was called. And I had to open a center in Costa Rica, where we've now been for 10 years. Um, the purpose of the center in Costa Rica is to help people ostensibly, of course, go back to who they are in truth, as we all know. Uh, but mostly from a practical point of view in the illusion is to help them recognize that who they think they are is not who they are. And so people come to us with uh, a range of labels from alcoholism to drug abuse to bipolar to uh, schizophrenic. We have uh, one woman who's labeled schizophrenic who's been with us for over two years now. Almost. Almost two years and is doing unbelievably well and we probably will live there because she is uh, schizophrenic. But my main purpose is to get people to see who they are and to get to understand that who they think they are has never been who they are. That it was an invention. That you made it up. It's just a thought. It's my thoughts alone that cause me pain. It goes back and back and back always to who is the I? Who is the I that's believing this thought? Who is the I that's upset? Myron, would you mind very much if I used your story from yesterday? Yeah? Myron told a wonderful story yesterday when I was in her, in her talk. 
uh, about a co-worker who came um, and Maya made some adjustments in her own pattern of earning, in her own pattern of, of working uh, the job that she does in order to help this person and help the company and ultimately, of course, help herself in that process. But what she found was that um, she developed a, a fairly profound negative reaction. Tell me, interrupt me when I'm representing you wrongly. Um, a fairly substantial negative reaction to this person. And she took some time to go back to the truth of who she was and who this person was. Um, which is a wonderful story. And it took you three months, two months? Oh, I bet you it took me almost a year. A year. Let me, let me read you a, a, little, a little something out of this little book that we all play with <laughs> when we're playing. And that is, um, huh. it's on page 32 of your Bibles. <laughs> and this really um, is a very important line. It says this, nothing and everything cannot coexist. To believe in one is to deny the other. Fear is really nothing, and love is everything. Whenever light enters the darkness, darkness is abolished. What you believe is true for you. And in this sense, a separation has occurred, and to deny it is merely to use denial inappropriately. However, to concentrate on error is only a further error. The initial corrective procedure is to recognize temporarily that there is a problem, but only as an indication that immediate correction is needed. Immediate correction. And what I hear over and over uh, wherever we travel, because we do a fair bit of traveling and a fair bit of listening and talking with other course students and teachers, is um, a spiritual patience with the process that I've come to understand for me as pure ego indulgence. And Myron, who I admire and adore and just met this weekend, but have met many, many times uh, on Facebook with her brilliant insights, took a year to overcome this aversion. What we do at the center is to teach you and teach me to overcome it within seconds because there's absolutely no reason. Does that make sense? There's absolutely no reason to feel anything other than love for you, for me, which is the same thing. There is no reason not to. And if I don't feel that, it's simply because I'm seeing something in you that I don't like in myself and I don't want to look at it. Not only do I not want to look at it, I want to keep it. <laughs> and why do I want to keep it? Because it is my identity. And I will defend my identity at all costs, even if it's going to kill me, and in my case, it just about did. And my hunch is that in your cases, it will, if not physically, certainly spiritually, do you in. So as long as I hang on to my self-made identity, which is pure ego, as long as I defend it, and I will defend it, but as long as I do that, I will continue lead, leading myself to a spiritual death. And to me, that spiritual death came way too close uh, for comfort to a physical death as well, at the same time. I loved your story yesterday about your son, by the way. Thank you. It was beautiful. Um, so what our process is about, and I'll, I'll walk you through it, and then hopefully we'll have people who would like to have a, a little experience, a rector experience of this work. Um, we've developed a six-step process, and when I say we've developed it, 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 it's got nothing to do with me. Every single step of this process is in, in the Course of Miracles. All you have to do is look at it, you'll find every single step we take in that process. So the first step of our process is to acknowledge that you're upset. Now that sounds easy, um, but I can assure you, and maybe there's some other people that uh, who uh, would echo that experience, I was upset um, no more than 24 hours a day. 
I was absolutely continuously chronically upset and, and, and I expressed that either with incredible anger and rage or I expressed that with complete num numbness. But there was nothing in So I was chronically upset and I had no idea that I was. But it took me a while to be able to begin to see that if I could just say I'm upset, then that would be a very first, very first careful step in a direction of taking a look at that. As, as I just read, temporarily there's a problem. So that's step one. Step two is a more important step from my point of view, from a developmental point of view, and that is to say it's about me. That's step two, it's about me. So if I look back over the many years that uh, I didn't do this work and talked about uh, all kinds of other nonsense and uh, I studied philosophy, I studied whatever I could get my hands on, but one thing I never ever learned anywhere was to say it's about me. It was always about you. It was always about the weather. It was always about the fact that I had no money. It was always about the fact that I was born in a concentration camp and all that silly nonsense. It was always about something else. So when I realized that the Course talks about step two, it's about me on almost every page. It's my thoughts alone that cause me pain. It's my thoughts alone that cause me pain. Wow, it's my thoughts alone that cause me pain. That is step two. So it's not about you, it's not about my partner, it's not about my wife, it's not about you name it, it's about me. That's a huge step. And when we work at the center, which we do um, every day, we have two circles a day, um, this is what we do all day long, it is amazing that even I, who do this professionally, have done it now for 20 years, and who teaches step two, I can't tell you how many times a day I say, oh, but this is different. <laughs> this, this is now we finally have discovered an exception to the story. Right, man? This guy was different. <laughs> you had your story. And then to, uh, to have made sure that I have mighty companions who will immediately tap me on the shoulder and say, no, it's not different. It's still about you. And then the ego comes in brilliantly and starts defending its position, explaining why. And this is why we don't do story. Because in this story, I can tell you how this is not about me. In the story, I get to be right, that this is about you. This actually is not about me. So we don't do story. I hope that makes sense by now, why we don't do story. And I hope you can take a look at that over time and say, well, maybe I'll stop telling stories too. The third step, um, everybody on board with step two, by the way? Anybody who says, fuck that, I'm not doing it? <laughs> Just be honest, all the hands should go up. <laughs> because I can guarantee you we'll walk out of here and every single one of us, including me, will immediately think it's not about me. But if I do train my mind over and over and over to go back to step two, it will become more and more true and it will become the way out. So step two, it's about me. Step three is to go to the feeling. And um, as I said, um, I was very, I had a rich, palette of feelings that was numb and rage. That was all the feelings I knew. So when I started doing my so-called counseling practice, um, I developed a feeling sheet, which originally was of course just for me, like everything I do is for me. Uh, but this was ostensibly to help my clients understand their feelings. And the first time I used it, there's about 90 feelings on there. And the first time I used it with, with a couple that came to see me with a husband was a, a minister in a prominent large congregation and his wife had just discovered that uh, this wonderful important spiritual leader had had uh, an affair with her best friend for three years and sh she was not happy about that and she wasn't prepared to do step two at that point either so we didn't even go there but what we did do is give the feeling sheet I gave both the feeling sheet and he looked at it and he crossed off one and he crossed off another and he crossed off another and he, he got to about five and, and he was visibly impressed with himself and, and so was I. But, and I looked uh, over at her and she hadn't crossed a single one off yet. So after a few minutes of this it said, well, it seems to me like uh, you found a few feelings to work with and uh, I don't think you found one yet. So I said to the, to the woman and she crossed off board. I said, that's the only feeling I'm not feeling. <laughs> so she had a huge range of feelings. And here's the good news. As you all know from that fantastic line from the Course that says, I, I choose the feelings I experience. 
I choose the feelings I experience. No one makes me feel, again, that's step two, nobody makes me feel anything. I choose the feelings I experience. Now the lesson that we're teaching from that particular line is, who is the I that's choosing it? Who's the I that's choosing to be angry? Who's the I that's choosing to feel sad? Who's the I that's choosing to feel mildly irritated? That I is a belief. Does that make sense? So that I is nothing other than a belief. There is no I that chooses other than an imaginary illusory air I that I made up. And because I made it up, I believe that that's actually who I am. And that's why we validate feelings. But if you come to our center, I will never validate feelings. Feelings only have one purpose. And the only purpose for the feeling is to help me go back to the I that chose it. Does that make sense? So the I that chose the feeling. So, but in order to get to that I, I have to feel, which I've indicated now uh, was a, a major challenge for me because I didn't know what feelings were. But once I learned to feel, and once I learned to follow that feeling back to the very first time I ever felt that. Now that's a big step as well because most people say, oh, I don't remember anything before 18. But here's the good news. If you truly are in your feeling, it will take you back. I'll tell you a little uh, funny story that I had many years ago, about six or seven years ago. I was with a, an old friend of mine, an old um, ex-drinking buddy. Um, and we were in a Japanese restaurant and, and um, even though I don't drink to kill myself anymore, I still really enjoy drinking. So we had a fair number of sakis and I was having a wonderful evening and he turned to me and he said, that work you do, that's really bullshit, isn't it? And I said, well, <laughs> could be. And he said, why are you doing it? And I said, well, because I really want to be at peace. And uh, I've, I've been at war with this, uh, myself and the world for way too long. And uh, my one and only purpose now is to be increasingly at peace. I said, I don't need that. And so that's all right. I know the guy really well, so I know that what he said right there was complete nonsense. Um, he said, I don't need that. And I said, well, that's great. So that means you're, you're at peace. And he said, oh, I'm at peace all the time. And at that moment, in the, the tiny room next to us, a cell phone went off. And he said, that pisses me off. <laughs> I said, it's not interesting. And because he'd been drinking, there was no resistance. So I said, what did it remind you of? And he went back, I'm three years old, I'm sitting in my parents' house in Ireland, and my sister just pissed in the corner. That's what came up for him in that feeling. That is the work in full flight. Now, if he'd been sober, he would never, ever gone there, but he wouldn't have allowed me to go there. He wouldn't have allowed himself to go there, but because he'd been drinking, he went back to that moment. And I said, great, and what did that mean about you when your sister did that? And he said, I'm not important. Yes, that's it. Hmm. Now, he works uh, an average of 10 hours a day, six days a week, makes millions of dollars a year. Why? To cover up the belief that he's not important, and he never knew that. Now, when he sobered up the next day, he didn't know it again, so it didn't really matter. I mean, and he's not a client, so I had absolutely zero investment in him staying with that. But it was such a beautiful illustration of somebody allowing a feeling to take him back to the moment when you first felt it. Because that's all we do. You all know that section from the Course where it says every day and every hour in each day and every minute that each hour holds you, but relive the moment when the time of terror took the place of love. And that's what I do, that's what you do. All day long is a replay. How exciting does that sound? <laughs> Every moment is a replay, and it's a replay of when I first chose to remember, when I first chose to feel, when I first chose to believe that I'm separate. Now ultimately, of course, the Course is talking about the moment when I had that tiny mad idea, we remembered not to laugh, we all did that. But I don't work at that level because to me, I don't really understand that yet. So I work at a level just above that is where I made up beliefs. And the beliefs are, is what, of course, what keeps me separate, but also I have to undo the beliefs in order to go to that final step and to recognize that oneness is the truth. And oneness is the truth, we all know that. But from our point of view, from a, a practical healing center, point of view, 
it doesn't serve me to speak in concepts only. What serves me is to actually come up with a practical way of getting to the beliefs, and this process is, is that way. So, I arrived back at the moment when I first had this feeling. Um, one of my beliefs was um, that I wasn't supported. And I lived that out all the time, and even when people were supporting me um, wholeheartedly, 100%, I would reject that to the point where they said, well, we're not supporting you anymore, and that's I see. And I got to be right. So my whole life was, was a, a continuing sequence of being right about beliefs. And you know the fantastic uh, cliche line that it, everybody uses all the time, you can choose to be right or happy, and the key word is or. And the, the ego has no idea, the ego is very, very, very good at being right. So I was right that I was not supported. And I traced that back. Where did that come from? Well, that came from right after the war. In '45, I received my first toy. Because you can imagine in the camps there's not a lot of toys being handed out. Uh, so I got, I got a beautiful red metal truck. And I always think it was that big because I was that big. It probably was only about this big. But it was beautiful. I absolutely loved it. And I also met my father for the first time, who had been in different camps for three and a half years. And we were walking across a boardwalk, um, um, across a fish pond, and the truck slipped out of my hands into the water. And my father would not go in the water to get it. At that moment, I made up, I'm not supported. I made up a bunch of other stuff at that moment too, but I had already made that up earlier. But I was not supported, it was very clear at that moment. And the rage when I felt, that I felt when I was three and a half, and my father wouldn't go in the water to get that truck, is the rage that I would feel over and over and over when I made up that people were not supporting me. Till I finally learned to work with it, to finally found um, the process that we use now, and to recognize it's not true. I'm divinely supported. I'm divinely supported. And that's an incredible experience, an incredible awareness, an incredible truth that suddenly came through for me. And it took a long time. And even today, as, as Claudia will, will tell you, even today I will invent ways to see lack of support. And even if you're supporting me, which you clearly are doing by being here, I will find a way to minimize it and make it less valuable. Now, thank God, there is progress. <laughs> if there wasn't progress, I probably would have driven off the, off the road a long time ago. There is incredible progress. So I'm seeing it less and less, and now when I feel it, it's just a little pang. So, okay, there it is. Wow, that's that same belief. Does that make sense so far? So the process, number one, I'm upset. Number two, it's about me. Number three, I need to go to the feeling. And the question that I ask with that feeling, is this feeling familiar? Because the ego will want to make it specific. The ego will want to say, it's now. It's because Lynn is wearing purple, and I hate purple, and that's why I feel this way. And I want to be right about that. And I will defend that. And I will call on other friends. And they will all say, oh, no, Dirk hates purple, and then she's wearing it. That's why I'm upset. That's what friends are for in the ego world, is to collude with my insanity. <laughs> Step two, it's about me. It's not about the purple shirt. It's not about Lynn at all, it's about me. What does the purple bring up for me? How do I feel when I see that purple? The next step of that is to even drop the word purple, because it's not about that either. It's just about the feeling. It's just about the feeling. And then not to make the feeling important, because the feeling is not important. The feeling only has one purpose, and that's to take me back to the first time I felt that. And the next step is to ask, what did I make up about myself when I first felt that? So what did it say about me that my father wouldn't pick up that truck? It said I wasn't loved, it said I wasn't important, it said I wasn't supported, and probably a few other things, but those are the three that I work with. Those are three of part of my, uh, the self I made up. And then the, the following step is to do forgiveness. And the forgiveness, as you all know, because you're all very good core students, is never, ever, ever about the other person. That's why step two is also so important. It's not about the other person ever. So it's, I'm not forgiving my father for not going in the water. I forgive myself for believing 
that it meant that I wasn't loved. I forgive myself for the insane belief that I could actually believe that I was not and that I was not supported. I forgive myself for the insane belief that I'm not important, I'm not loved, I'm not supported. Those are insane beliefs. But as long as I don't do the forgiveness on them, I will live as if they're true. That's the piss off. I will live as if they're true, and because I live as if they're true, I will have incredible, incredibly convincing evidence. Because to me it is true. And it will continue to be true till I change my mind. Um, Ramana Maharshi was one of, one of um, the earlier authors of the Course. Um, has the one question that he keeps asking is, who are you? Who are you? And that to me is such a wonderful shortcut uh, that cuts through about 1400 pages of course material, is who is the I that has this thought? Who is the I, Myron, back to your story, who is the I that didn't like this person? Who is the I that found it difficult to work with him? Who is the I that got angry at my son when he kept using drugs? Because that I is an I that I make up. That I does not exist. But to defend it over and over and over and to say, no, no, it's not, it's not about this, this I is right this time. That's lethal. That will do me in. Make sense? Cool. So the last step is forgive me for forgetting. And so the first is to forgive me for believing, forgive me for believing I'm not loved, forgive me for believing I'm not important. Then never go back to, oh, you are loved, look at all the people that love you. That is insane. That is equally insane. You go back to the truth of who you are. Like a lot of people come to the center and they have a belief that I've never had. I don't know why I didn't have that, but I, I probably should have had, but I didn't have, and that's a belief that I'm stupid. I don't have that belief, but a lot of people do. And so they come to the center and they come up to that, uh, that belief and they say, forgive me for believing I'm stupid. And then somebody will say, it's not true, you have a PhD. That is not why you're not stupid. You're not stupid because you have divine intelligence. Does that make sense? So it, it never is a matter of any valid value in the, in the illusion, which we call this little world. It's always about the eternal truth that it's not true. So forgive me for believing I'm not loved is not met with, oh, look at all the people that love you. That's not the issue. Look at who you are. It is impossible that you and I are not loved. Even if this whole room hates me, and walks out of here and says, we hate that guy, it would have absolutely no impact on me at all. Because <laughs> I know who I am. I am love. Um, I think it's Byron Katie that has that fantastic line that I absolutely love. And she says, when I walk into a room, I know that everybody adores me. They don't know it yet. <laughs> That's really how it works. That's really how it works. So if I keep coming back for my worth is established by God. Wow. When I first read that, I started to cry. I said, wow, that's unbelievable. What an incredible statement. Where worth is established by God. I have nothing to prove. I don't have to fight. I don't have to claw. I don't have to put you down, which is what I was really good at. I don't have to do anything other than accept that truth and move into that truth. My worth is established by God. What a trip. And so many people, we got people uh, coming, so many times we got people come to the center who um, have no experience uh, with spirituality and who have a lot of difficulty with the word God. So then we, we do, of course, the first process is about the word God. So step one, I'm upset at the word God. No, you're not upset at the word God, you're upset. Step two, it's about you. It's not about the word God. Step three, how do you feel when you hear that word? And then invariably it goes back to an early experience of somebody doing something to them in the name of God. And there, there's always a connotation between the image of God that I have and my experience of the word God that I, um, that I live with on an ongoing basis. And that is always, always, always a reflection of who I think I am. So if I have a problem with the word God, it's because I'm seeing myself. 
And I made up a God that is exactly like me. He's a temperamental bastard. He sends floods. He punishes whole populations. He wipes out God knows how many babies. That's what the God that I made up does. But if I replace that word in my mind, if I go back to who am I in truth, then that game is over. And then I recognize I don't have to change the word God. My daughter, when she first picked up this book, she was 15. Um, and in those days, I'm, I had very little money. But the little money I had, I, I spent on buying people courses. So I bought courses for, God knows, 20 people. None of them ever opened it, but that's not the point. My daughter did open it, and she then went to work to changing the word he to she. She went to work changing the father to mother. She went from brother to sister, and till we finally got to how do you feel when you read the word father, when you read the word brother, when you read the word son, what comes up for you? Step two, in other words, it's about you, it's not about those words. And it came up with I'm lesser than. That's what she made up. Now the danger from I am lesser than is that you connect it to a reason. I'm lesser than because society tells me I'm a woman and therefore I'm lesser than. No, that's not it. That's once again looking outside of you to find a reason. I'm lesser than is a decision I make, whether I'm male or female or nothing. I make a decision I'm lesser than. No, society cannot do that to me. So this work, as you know by now, <clears throat> from your own experience and certainly from, from listening to this little bit of uh, talking, is that it's the end of the victim position. It is absolutely impossible to do A Course in Miracles, truly do it, on a daily basis and maintain a victim position. It cannot be done. Because I'm the author of my experience. Everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. How exciting is that? Yeah. Right, Marin? Marin, it goes back to your story again. I asked for this guy. But why did I ask for him? I asked for him because he's reflecting something in me that I want to heal now. And what is that? What is the belief? that makes me choose not to like a person. It could never have anything to do with that person. Lesson 78, if you want to save your own relationship or any other relationship, just read Lesson 78. She stands in light, I am in the dark. End of the story. Wow, what a piss off. <laughs> it's not about the other person. She stands in light, even if she's yelling at me, throwing pots and pans at me, coming at me with a knife, she stands in light, I'm in the dark, because I'm believing the attack. Mm -hmm. The secret of salvation is about this. I am doing this unto myself. No matter what the form of the attack or who takes the role of the attacker still, is this the truth? I am doing this to myself. All of these things lead back to 100% ownership of every single aspect of my experience on this planet and not out of guilt and not out of resentment and not out of it shouldn't be this way but out of incredible gratitude that it is this way because this is how I choose my healing. Uh, most of you know the name Jerry Jampolsky. Jerry Jampolsky started out at only healing because he took one look at this book and said it's a great book but nobody will read it so he redesigned it into something like Love is Letting Go of Fear and then a whole um, way of looking and, and working the course um, that makes it a lot more palatable and easier for people and that apparently is important. Um, it never appealed to me because I love the, the so-called difficulty of the course. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted with that. But anyway, he had a series of cards at um, the Aratonal Healing Center in Sausalito and one of them was um, I'm responsible for the world I see. I decide upon the goal I would achieve. I choose the feelings I experience. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I've asked. And because that center dealt primarily with people with life-threatening illnesses, you can imagine that that last line, to any ego, is a very challenging line. Everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I've asked. And that is a horrible, horrible, guilt-tripping line as long as I think that anything ever has gone wrong. But if I accept that absolutely nothing ever has gone wrong and never will go wrong and never can go wrong because there is only God, there is only love, then that is a fantastic line to live with. Everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for you. Of course I asked for it. 
because I needed to do that little bit of healing. I needed to bring this person into my life to once again look at an old belief that I made up 70 years ago and I'm now ready to really look at it and say, no, it's not who I am, I made that up. That's why I asked for it, not in order to get punished again. That's old religion. We've had a number of people at the center who come from one of the many uh, Christian traditions or the Judeo-Christian traditions where punishment is absolutely important and the more I'm punished the better my chance of going to heaven is. That is an obscene way of looking at the world. There is no punishment. There's only it's Christmas every day. Everything is a gift. So this person that walks into Myron's life was a gift and all that was waiting for is for me to open the gift. Am I willing to open the gift or do I want to keep thinking this is not what I asked for? That's the only question on the table. The question is lesson 25. I don't know what anything is for, but it's for me. Wow, lesson 25. Three, three weeks and a couple days into doing this work, I'm told, I don't know what anything is for, but it's for me. Imagine if I lived that way on a 24-hour days or seven days a week basis, what an incredible life I would have. And I don't know if you know anybody that lives that way, but I've yet to meet someone that lives that way. And that's not because I have a judgment of that, so it's simply an observation of my own mind. My own ego doesn't want to live that way. Because the ego resents this work at an incredible level, for good reason. Because basically what I'm hearing over and over is I don't exist. And that now is incredibly exciting and wonderful news, but I can assure you to a lot of minds that come to the center and that pick up the course to hear you don't exist is not good news. <laughs> but somebody mentioned lesson 12 yesterday, and I, I do want to read that because to me that's, that is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite parts of... By the way, you guys know when you open the course anywhere, it will say this is the one thing you need to know? <laughs> okay, I have about 400 of those. But this is one that uh, you don't need to know. I do need to know this. And it says this, what is meaningless is neither good nor bad. Why then should a meaningless world upset me? If I could accept the world as meaningless and let the truth be written upon it for me, it would make me indescribably happy. But because it's meaningless, I am empowered to write upon it what I would have it be. And it is this I see in it. It is this that is meaningless in truth. And beneath my words are written the words of God. The truth upsets me now, but when my words have been erased, I will see his. And that is the ultimate purposes of these exercises. So my words are chosen by the I that I make up. I made that up um, that in utero starting 70, almost 73 years ago and for the first eight years I made up an I. And that I has been on the planet now for all that time thinking it actually is here, thinking it actually exists, thinking it actually is evil, nasty, horrible, disgusting. Also thinking sometimes it's really nice and really bright and really tall, particularly tall, <laughs> that, I, that I can get away with because it's true, but that's not who I am. And so if I can actually step back, and this is one thing you've heard many times this weekend and will continue to hear, to me forgiveness is a really big deal. There's no question about it, forgiveness is a big deal. I'm beginning to think more and more that surrender is a bigger deal. Because if I truly surrender, I don't have to do forgiveness. So if I surrender to who I am, Forgiveness no longer plays a function, plays a role. Because if I surrender to the truth within me, there is nothing to forgive. Now it goes both ways, of course, I have to do a lot of forgiveness in order to allow surrender to, to be a reality for me, but surrender is the name of the game. So often in, in the circles, um, I mean, we live in circles. I do circles seven days a week. I'm not in the circle seven days a week, but I certainly live it every day. In the circle, sometimes we get people who have an experience that they tell us about, whether it's sexual abuse or child abuse or whatever it was, spousal abuse, betrayal, you name it, and they have a very convincing story. And they're not in the habit of handing it over. All of you hand stories over, right? Um, right. Never. Never. <laughs> 
Um, but if you're not in the habit of handing it over, then what is helpful is to go around the group and say, is there another way of seeing it? And then uh, Peter will say, yeah, I can see it this way. And then Jennifer will say, actually, I see it this way. And then Raina will say, well, I see it this way. And then Claudia will say, I see it this way. And now we have four people who've chosen a different interpretation of the story. And then we go back to the original person who had the convincing story and say, there's all these other ways of seeing it. Let's face it, none of them are true. All of them are perception. All of them are made up by an ego. None of them are true, but you get to choose which one you want to hang on to. So the one you're hanging on to now is making you profoundly miserable. Is that the one you want to keep? And then the answer, if they're really honest and really willing to start making a difference in their lives, is no, it's not the one I want to keep. I want to, I want to find another one. Then we go to the next step. And then we say, well, how about if you hand it over to that loving part within you that is just waiting? The loving part that never believed the word you thought, that never bought any of your bullshit, that never agreed with your assessment of yourself and of the world. How about if you ask that part to give you yet another interpretation? And then, uh, this is one of the highlights of, of our work, then the, the look on their face is unbelievable because they totally change immediately. And they say, how would that feel if you could actually ask the loving part within you to reinterpret what you just thought? And they would say, that would feel incredible. And that's exactly what that paragraph in Lesson 12 is talking about. You, it would make you indescribably happy if I just withdrew my own interpretation and I just said, I don't know. I think it's this, but it can't be this because I'm not happy when I think that, so it cannot be true. Which is, by the way, a shortcut to our work. So the shortcut is, I'm upset. What does that mean? That means I'm believing something about me that's not true. What is that belief? That belief is I'm not lovable, I'm not supported, I'm not important, I'm not good enough. How many people here have to believe I'm not good enough? Every hand shoots up. Isn't that unbelievable? Seven billion people crawl around this little planet thinking you're not good enough. It's unbelievable. And yet, we defend it. I mean, if, if, I, if we had a magic wand and we could remove that belief I'm not good enough, what would happen to commerce? What would happen to advertising? What would happen to fashion industry? What would happen to diet plans? Everybody would be out of business, so we can't afford to do it. <laughs> so by all means, uh, we, we had one person at the center who came about nine years ago and, and just recently came back as a full-time staff member. She had a very strong belief that her worth was established by how hard she worked. And because she was a volunteer, we didn't really process that belief. <laughs> You're right. Keep that one. You're doing it. <laughs> Your worth is going up and up and up. There's some more. There's more. <laughs> so I'd love to open the floor to questions and or real life um, stories that we can work with. Yes? Uh, two questions. The first is, uh, it seems, it's always seemed odd to me that the word surrender does not appear anywhere in the course. Where I would think that it would. But I don't know if you know that or if you have any ideas why Jesus would never use that. Well, when I wrote the course, I didn't really think of that. <laughs> <laughs> See, then I really thought forgiveness was it. But now I, I, I don't know if it's not in the course. I'm, I'm not that kind of a scholar. But if you say it's not in the course, then I, I totally... But if you read what I just read in paragraph 12, mm -hmm. that is surrender. If I just allow the truth to be written on it for me, that is surrender. Does that answer your question at all? You know what? But by all means, when you rewrite the course, and we all do, uh, put the word surrender it next time. <laughs> yes, let me know. There'll be an, another addition. Yeah. The other, the other question was, is, uh, do you have any perspective on reincarnation, the idea of reincarnation? Um, the, the manual for teachers answered that really quite nicely in the back. It says, uh, don't go there. If it makes you happy, if the thought of reincarnation brings you comfort, by all means, do. It's um, but what it also says, I think, and I'm, I'm not a course scholar, but it, I think it does say it still doesn't change the fact that salvation is available now, not at some future lifetime. So 
it, to me, it it uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, if that's if that's part of your belief system, if karma is part of your belief system, and it brings you peace, by all means, live with it. My question always is, how do you feel? How does it feel when you think about reincarnation? How do how does it feel? Uh, when somebody does a past life uh, regression with you and you find out uh, everybody here by the way was a pharaoh, did you know that? Did, I've yet to hear someone who did a past life regression who was not a pharaoh um, or the mistress of a pharaoh or one or the other it, it preferably both yeah. Teacher, could you describe to us a little bit how day-to-day -day life goes at the center? Just a minute, I can, I can do it again Would you describe to us a little bit about life at the center? the resident staff, the guests that come, the prolonged guests, kind of give us an overview? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an incredible life. I wake up at 6.30, 7 o'clock. Um, if you're really fortunate, you'll have Claudia teaching you an amazing yoga class. And Claudia combines uh, a huge depth of understanding of how the body works with the spiritual aspect of our work. So the combination of yoga and our work is fantastic. That goes to about 8.30, then it's breakfast. Then at 9.30, the clients meet uh, themselves in a circle where, which is led by one of them, and they choose a subject to discuss and work through. At 10 o'clock, uh, the staff joins them, and there's usually, I mean, we have uh, eight staff at the center, and never more, I mean, at the moment, we have one client. So if you were the one client, you get a lot of attention. You, you, you can't hide. See, that's the Holy Spirit telling me time is up. <laughs> Let there be light, and there was light. Um, so then we join, uh, the staff joins in the circle. And often, there's way more staff than clients, and it makes absolutely no difference. Every single one of us is working on the same shit. I want to make that really clear. I mean, we, there's not, um, if, if I ever have somebody on staff who says they're enlightened or they know the answer, uh, I will be running so fast that you'll, you'll see a little puff and I'll be gone. I don't do that. I, I, I think we're all working on the same thing. It makes no difference what you do for a living. We're all working on the same beliefs. That circle runs till about 12.30 or 1, then we have lunch. Um, then people go for um, a wonderful walk in the hills. We're located at 2,700 feet um, in rainforest and meadows and farms, um, completely rural, where you hear nothing but monkeys and birds and insects um, and our dogs barking. We have four dogs. We have three dogs now. One moved on, one trained to form. Four cats. Four cats. Um, then after the walk, we either reconvene in the circle. If the circle was really intense and there's a lot of things that are unresolved, I mean, there's, there's never a circle where anything is resolved, of course, because then we wouldn't be here. Uh, but if it's still urgent, then we go back into the circle or we watch a DVD. Um, Carol Howe just gave us a set of uh, DVDs which we find incredibly helpful, beautifully uh, expressed. Um, then it's dinner, and after dinner, most people are asleep by 8.30 or 9. And that's a day, and that's seven days a week. Hot springs. Um, hot springs. Once a week, <laughs> they, these girls want to go to the hot springs. Once a week, <laughs> and pandas too, once a week we do uh, leave the property and we go somewhere else. We either go to the hot springs, which are about um, three quarters of an hour drive away at the foot of the volcano. And that's an incredible experience. You sit in a hot river. Yeah. Or you sit under a hot, a hot waterfall, which gives you a massage uh, uh, as long as you want in the spot you wanted at. Um, but that's really the only time away from doing the actual work, which some people absolutely love and some people absolutely hate. I mean, it's, it's not an easy press. I was talking to someone, uh, Jackie is here. Uh, about coming to the center as a, as a volunteer. And I, I just want to make really clear, if you want to come to the center, it is, it's, it's not, it, it becomes a wonderful and fun place when you do your work. But if I'm not doing my work, it is probably the worst place on the planet. It is really a tough, tough, tough environment because we don't do story, we don't do mindless conversations about the Rangers beating Pittsburgh. We, we don't talk uh, about politics. We're, I'm not interested. So it's very, I heard somebody, I think it was today, talk about having a normal conversation. I'm not good at that. 
my, I am absolutely convinced that if I have completed my work, which will probably happen in another 40 years, I will have absolutely zero to say. So as long as I'm talking, you know I'm not done because I'm talking about something I need to learn. That's all I talk about. It's not because I have learned it and I'm going to tell all you wonderful people how to do it. It's because I am learning this. That's, a, that's why I'm doing it. The center is purely there for me. And the people that come there bring me my stuff. And as long as the staff is clear of that, they will have an incredible time. And as long as the clients realize that clients are students and clients are staff are the same, and we're all working on the same stuff, it is immensely effective. We have a success rate of an excess of 85% of everything, including alcoholism. Alcoholism has an average of 25 universally, ours is over 85%. We have a 95% success rate in getting people off all medication, period. We've had people there, one woman comes to mind in particular who came uh, in the end of August, the month of July, and the beginning of August she had had 13 ECTs, electric shock treatment, and she was on 14 different medications, and she was on three street drugs. Now she was there for seven months. It took a long time, and it, was, it, it took a lot of us saying there's nothing wrong with you. And she kept proving, yes, there is. And she kept proving it, and she kept proving it. And she did unbelievable shit. I mean, she was amazing what she pulled off in order for us to finally believe that there was something wrong with her. And all we kept saying, there's nothing wrong with you. You know the great line, when the brother behaves insanely, you can only heal him by perceiving the truth and the sanity in him. That's all we do. We're not psychologists. Thank God. Where's my friend? Yeah. <laughs> I, I talked a little bit about what you just said, leaving your story behind, because for me, I didn't see any change practicing the course until I made a decision not to be my story. Right. And from that moment on, when I decided to show up every day without all the labels, I am beautiful. And uh, this is my special diet, this is my special food. All the things that I created to make me feel different from other people. As long as I have all these labels, I was different from my friends. Yep. And that kept me spiritually bound. So when I decided when I was doing the work, and I decided to change the story, and leave it behind, and just show up every day, and see what happens, then the thought reversal process that the Course talks about, I started noticing that. Mm -hmm. I was no longer preoccupied with who I was, what I was doing, my job. I should be a vegan, I should be a meat eater, like all that other stuff. Yep. You know, all the special things of the personality. Then, the changes that happen. So I do believe, I believe you. I yep. Because I see it in myself and I see it in my story, so to speak. Yep. How it's starting to change and therefore I'm more peaceful. Yep. So thank you very much. You're thank you for, for your observation. That's, that's brilliantly put. It's a, it's, it's a line, who would I be without my story? And it's a breathtaking question because the answer is I have no idea. I have no idea, but I do know that if I do drop my story, as you just said, all the issues that I think I have in my life are the direct result of me projecting my personality, the personality is the set of beliefs that I made up, onto the situation, and that becomes a justification for my story again. And so the story is lethal. Well, it kept me trapped. Absolutely. The story, the story is how I keep myself trapped. Right. And in order to, to sustain being trapped, which comes from a belief in weakness and belief in powerlessness and belief that I'm a victim, I have to keep telling my story. And we've had, I don't know how many people here um, are, uh, go to... The Holy Shadow Spirit just shut me off. <laughs> it's probably about time too. Um, in AA, one of the many differences between the work that we do in AA is that in AA, from my own experience from going and from hearing a lot of people that come to our center, is that you keep telling your story. 
And if I keep saying my name is Dilek, I'm an alcoholic, guess what? <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. What I will say is my name is Dilek. I hated myself so much that I tried to kill myself with booze and other things, but that's not who I am. The ultimate AA group is, of course, where you only say my name is Dilek, because that is the problem. Does that make sense? Yes. So the minute I identify myself as Dilek, I'm stuck. Because that's not who I am. That's a belief. Yeah. I'm not Diederik and that's not Rena. Who we are is the same. Who we are is one. Who we are is the truth. Who I am is spirit. That's limitless. Everything else is a belief. Everything else is a projection of a story I want to be right about. And I'm going to defend that identity at all costs. That's how insane I was and still am so often. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I, I know my story. My story is, look how I've been unfairly treated. That's my story. My setup, my birth order, the geography, the birth order, my family geography, all of it is a setup to play that out. I know my story. So I'm in the midst of playing out, look how I've been unfairly treated at my job at work right now. And um, I'm being accused of something I didn't do. In a way that is that I might get fired over it, mm -hmm. and um, I know it. This is my story. I know my story is look how I've been unfairly treated and see how it's still happening. And I know that I created this. I'm not a victim. Nobody's guilty. My brother's sinless. But I'm in this place of do I walk away? Okay. Do I walk away quietly from the story and just just go? I mean, part of me just wants to just go. I'm not even going to defend this. I just want to be done. I just want to leave. No, that's that's nonsense. So, and then the other part is, well, maybe I st I make a stand for truth, but I what equally, I brought, what I told Holy Spirit, I, what I told Holy Spirit is, I don't know what this is for. I don't know what this means, but I know that you know, and I know that I'm not doing this alone, mm -hmm. and I know that everything is for my salvation. So I just don't know how to show up. Okay. For this part of the story. Do you want to do you want to work through it? Yeah. yeah. Or do you want to keep it for I a while? I wouldn't let it go forever. Okay. Well. What would be <clears throat> yeah, I always get a little nervous, but I think I'm gonna let it go forever because that to me okay, is, well, is let the let ego. It's like for 15 minutes. That'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> so step one, I'm upset. Step two. I'm upset. Step two, it's about me. It's about me. So it's not about being accused. It's not about the thought that I'm unfairly treated. It's not about any of that. It's about me. Step three, how do I feel when I hear this accusation? What's the strongest feeling that comes up? The number one feeling? I'm innocent. No, that's not a, that's a thought that the ego would like to have. I feel. But you don't believe that for a second. No, I feel. So don't do a spiritual mind I feel my innocence is tarnished. My innocence has been tarnished. That's how I feel. That's a thought? That's, That's a, a thought. thought. What is the uh, feeling? I feel guilty. You feel guilty. Wonderful. Now be specific about read all the feelings that are that play out in this story. Read them out loud and we'll re I'll repeat them so everybody can okay, hear them. But I can't read them without my glasses. So that's pretty unfair that you need glasses. That's a story. So start at the very top on the left. What does that say? Right. Is that does that play at all? Yeah. Right. Alone. Abandoned, afraid, alone. Angry, angry. Angry. Ashamed, betrayed. Ashamed, betrayed. Blamed, fuckers. Blamed, fuck. Yeah. What else? <laughs> Those fuckers. Not bored. It's very exciting to be a victim. Yeah. Never boring to be a victim. Never bored. No, of course not. I don't want to be bored. Whatever I do. Burden, no. Cheated, yes. Yeah, cheated. Concerned, confused, no. I'm pretty clear about. Yeah, you seem very accurate. <laughs> you seem very confused. Right. I would leave that in there. I feel like cornered. I'm, I'm in defense. Yeah, don't see. Notice how immediately she wants to go back to the story. Dejected. So I feel yeah. cornered because. Yeah. Don't ever do that because you have no idea why you're feeling it yet. Disappointed. Yeah. Disappointed. Um, devastated. <laughs> devastated. See, he knows how you're feeling. <laughs> I'm, I'm disgusted. I'm yeah, disgusted. Definitely. Wonderful. So that's good enough for now. 
because we only have uh, another six hours. So, so choose one. Choose the strongest feeling you're feeling. I'm ashamed. Ashamed. What if they think no, 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 just say ashamed, okay? Notice how the ego wants to come in and explain it and justify it. I'm feeling ashamed. Now close your eyes and feel that feeling of shame. And then ask yourself, is that a familiar feeling? That's not the first time you felt it, is it? It's a familiar feeling. Now take it back to when you were a little girl. When is the first time you felt this feeling of shame? What's happening? Somebody is saying or doing something and you're feeling this deep shame. What is it? I, um, I snuck in a candy during Lent. You snuck in a candy during Lent? I snuck in some candy during Lent. Right. I couldn't give up candy during Lent. I couldn't give up the candy and yeah. I snuck in some candy I and I felt... I snuck in some candy during those 40 days I was supposed to suffer for God. Right. Yeah. That makes it even worse. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. So what did that say about you? That during the 40 days you were supposed to give to God, you snuck candy. Mm -hmm. What kind of a person would do that? A rebel. No, the rebel is nice. The ego likes rebels. But what is your judgment of people that promise 40 days to God and then they go sneak candy? But I didn't promise. My mom made me do it. I didn't oh, your mom made you do it. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. I'm a victim of her. Right, the big V goes in the forehead. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. So what did it say about you that you did that? If you're really honest, what would your judgment be of that yourself? I didn't believe. No, you, you did candy, which you knew you weren't supposed to do. And what's your judgment of yourself that you did that? That I was a rotten kid. I'm a rotten kid, thank you. That's a belief you made up. Yeah. And that's now living out when you're accused of doing something that you did or didn't do doesn't make any difference. You believe you're a rotten kid. Now do a forgiveness. Forgive me for believing I'm profoundly rotten. So look at me, make eye contact. Forgive me for a belief that I am rotten. Go ahead. Forgive me for holding the belief that I'm a rotten kid. That is not true. You made that up when you were little. When you took the candy, you made up you were rotten. But it will never be true. You're an innocent child of God and that's all you are. Let it go doesn't serve you. And I'll do it back to you, and you do the forgiveness for me. So forgive me for believing I'm rotten to the core. I believe you for giving I forgive you for believing that you're rotten to the core. You're only child of God. You can never be anything innocent. Fantastic. So now go back to the moment that you were accused at work. So close your eyes. And how did you find out you were being accused? Who said that? Who told you? Your boss told you. How do you feel now? He's telling you or she's telling you the same thing. How do you feel? There's less burden there. It's not gone, but it's weak. It's light. It's the lighter load. Right. So. It's still there. There's still something. Now, it may be the same belief that I'm a rotten person. It's lighter, but it's not as heavy. It may also be a different belief. Yeah. So there may be two or three beliefs that play out at the same time. But if I'm doing this work and you're doing this work with me, I would not stop till you felt nothing but love when this person accuses you. Because as long as I feel anything when somebody accuses me, it is because I'm believing it. Does that make sense? How many people here feel this vague sense of guilt when they go through customs in Houston? <laughs> <laughs> the days that I smuggled drugs through customs are long behind me. I'm, I have nothing. I have a course in miracles, but I feel guilty. Why? Because that is an old belief of mine. So if somebody accuses you of having done something that you know you didn't do, but you're upset about it, it's because you do believe you're capable of doing it. So that's the self you made up. It's not who you are. It's just a belief. It is not true. So it's not, I'm going to leave this position, because you know absolutely for sure that the rotten self that you made up, uh, in your case 38 years ago, is going to come with you and you'll have the same experience, not the same story necessarily, but the same experience of that shame will follow you around. 
till you finally say, wow, I want to stop. I'm not, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to defend because I didn't do this. There's nothing to defend. But I do believe that I'm capable of doing something like this because I remember being three years old taking candy. And at that point, I made up that I was this kind of person. I'm fully capable of stealing. Anybody here has never stolen? Look at this. I love this honesty. <laughs> It's very rare. Look, often when I talk to an audience who is not Corsi because all the hands go up. <laughs> They're all liars. All of us have stolen. <laughs> all of us have stolen. All of us have stolen. It just, did stealing change who I am in truth is the Corsi Miracles question. No, it didn't. So when you, when you took the candy, it did not change who you are, even slightly. You're absolutely innocent. Now, the last step is forgive me for forgetting that my innocence has never been affected by stealing candy or taking candy. It said nothing about me outside that took candy. Forgive me for believing that my innocence could ever be affected by taking candy. Thank God that is not true. That is not true. You made it up. Your worth is established by God, not by what you do or think or do or steal. It has no impact. Our jails, and particularly since I'm in the U.S. where the jail population is half uh, the country by now, <laughs> the jails are full of people that believe that they're guilty. But if we go into jails, and where is Joe here? No, Joe's not here. But if we go into, into the jail system and teach people that they were never guilty in the first place, yes, they did shit they shouldn't have done, but it didn't change who they are. Then we can empty the jails to, in my hunch, 95%. And then we have 5% of what we call the criminally insane. And they should probably be uh, helped in a different way. But if I can change the belief that I'm guilty. No, I like the light effects. It's, it reminds me of my old strobe light days. <laughs> if I can change the belief that I'm guilty, if I can truly go back to who I am in truth, which is innocence, the temptation to steal would not enter my mind. Uh, I'll give you one last uh, wonderful story, and this is about um, a man who came to us about six years ago who had been a heroin addict. Um, I'm saying had been because he was still, he was high as a kite when he arrived at the center. And he was with us for, I think, six weeks, and the last two weeks his mom was there with him. Um, the last two weeks his mother was with him and the last breakfast that he was there with his mother he said I'm never going to use again and I said that's a really interesting statement so I turned to his mom and I said um, when you go home will you resist the temptation to have oral sex with the five-year-old boy next door I said what are you talking about that would never enter my mind and I turned back to him and I said that's exactly where we need to be it wouldn't enter my mind to do drugs. Not, I'm never going to do drugs again, which is continuously having to fight the temptation to live out self-hatred, but to know that I love myself. So if you love yourself, and you do, because you're working at that full time, an accusation like that wouldn't have any effect on you. Because you know who you are. So you look at your accuser with nothing but love. And say, so whether I did it or not doesn't make really matter at this moment. I know who I am. And the, I can guarantee you that the person who accused you will immediately know that who you are is truth and innocence and that the accusation is, is, makes, has no validity at all because you know who you are. But not because you're defending yourself and you're proving you didn't do it. That's irrelevant. If I have to prove I didn't do something, I did it in my mind. Guaranteed. That's why I want to prove I didn't do it. Cool? Um, if, you, if you want to do the six step process here, um, I'll, I'll have them on the table here. Come pick them up. This is the short version. Um, thank you all for your attention.